sorry. I'm Ming Tan. <laughs> Last year this time, I was traveling the world, investigating food mysteries, disappearing fish in Indonesia, oh. <laughs> a butter crisis in France, and a menacing pest in Thailand. Now, the only traveling I do is this. Food deliveries. This is worse than anything I've ever seen. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Enjoy. Thank you. Okay. My business is shut. We're screwed. COVID-19 is the most disruptive force the global food industry has ever seen. The whole supply chain is disrupted. In the US, quite a number of the factories had to close because of COVID. So it's a major 30% drop. From farm to table, it is a wake-up call for all of us in this business. Intensive farms are potential breeding grounds for pathogens. It's like a meteor that came along. I just wet myself. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> in this series, I investigate how the pandemic is a wake-up call. Wait, 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 I'm on my... Ah! And what must change? I've gathered up chefs from all around the world. The restaurant industry is destroyed. We have to do something. We have to survive also as a restaurant. The pandemic has forced us to reevaluate how food gets to our table. Together, we're on a mission to find out. Open the lips of the muscles. That was a bit rude, ILG. How we can turn things for the better. You can do booking for two, and then um, the rest occasionally. But is it confirmed? I just want to address you guys um, for a couple of minutes. A bit surreal uh, telling you guys this. But all right, we're going to be shutting here for the next 30 days for the foreseeable future until the situation clears up. Okay, understood. You clear everything off that section, right? This was the night before I shut down my restaurant. I was a bundle of nerves. I am guessing there are a lot of cancellations. Do you know the numbers and how many? Today, we probably lost around 50% of that. Clams and a bikini for that, please. Thanks for supporting us for this last night. So uh, we're going to be shut from tomorrow onward. It was a decent last night of service, but it was also nerve-wracking. I didn't know what my future as a restaurateur was going to be, and if there was even one to begin with. Are we really honest with you guys? I don't know whether or not my younger staff understand the implications of what's happening right now. But there are massive changes happening to the food world. Massive layoffs everywhere. Since I was a child, I've always loved food. And at 19, I knew I wanted to make cooking a lifelong career. This is me as head chef at Lola, my big break. How many people get to manage an entire team at age 25? And in the last couple of years, I've been running various businesses. A Japanese eatery, private dining, an Asian grill, and an upmarket restaurant. Last year's revenue was the highest ever. I had great hopes for 2020. I never expected what was to come. When the government ordered restaurants to close on April 4th, Singapore's vibrant dining scene came to a grinding halt.
This is what I had to do. Picked up at 5.45 actually. Are you able to head out with it? 5.45, can. Okay. Yeah, Chanter Road. Okay, can. And we're off. At this point, I suppose you can say that I'm a chef, business owner, and a delivery man as well. It's a bit surreal, yes, that this is now the way to send food out to people. And it's definitely far less efficient than a restaurant, where you have guests come to you and then they sit down. So what to do? I don't even know if uh, our restaurants can sustain themselves over the next two, three weeks. Between January and July, 1,242 F&B outlets shuttered permanently. Including this two-decade-old dining fixture, Modestos. As a student, I used to come here to watch football and munch on pizza. I am quite emotional now because I had good memories here. Have you run the gamut of emotion knowing that you are shutting down an institution that's been here for 23 years? Uh, yes, I, I have cried a fair bit. In two months, Ashok lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I call it actually a Darwinian extinction event. You know, it's like a meteor that came along. And I think any of us who were fragile just got crushed. And why were we fragile? The last few years, in our industry, you will know very well the, the two forces which, which work so strongly against us. Labour costs have gone up exponentially. When we first started this restaurant, foreign worker levy was 50, 100, 200. Now it's 600, 700, 800. And rent also has gone up like double as well. When you talk to the REIT, it's always no. They're totally not interested to hear the word rent decrease. And um, they would rather take the risk of leaving a place empty than to give a sitting tenant a break. What do you think COVID exposed about some of the deficiencies in a restaurant of this type? Could anything have been different? Sure, we were too big. The rent was a huge weakness. Turnover is vanity, profit is reality, but cash flow is the only necessity. So while most businesses would have four to six months of cash flow, restaurants usually operate on two which means that if you don't turn in any profit for two months, you're in trouble. The thing is, we are not alone. Is that water or wine? Water, water. <laughs> wine after three. For the first time in history, restaurants all around the world are going through the same challenge, together. I am reaching out to some of my culinary heroes. Eric Repair, legendary chef from the United States. Margarita Forres, named Asia's best female chef in 2016. And Vicky Cheng, rising star in Hong Kong's fine dining scene. I want to know how they are coping. How has revenue been affected at this point? Well, the restaurant industry is obviously destroyed. For so one simple reason is that we are closed. Our goal for the moment is to try to generate at least enough sales so that we're not forced to retrench. In New York, uh, operating costs are enormous. The rents are very, very big. You have to have an enormous cash flow. I've seen a lot of restaurants go. In Hong Kong, the rents are absolutely not cheap. This COVID-19 crisis, it's something that we have never seen. So it's pretty clear. Running a successful restaurant anywhere in the world is a costly affair with potentially low returns. Consistently executing great food means hiring great cooks. 
that's 30% of our revenue. And then there is the cost of raw ingredients that can easily approach 30% of revenue. Rents can come up to 25%. Then of course, there is equipment, utilities, and marketing. Even for the very best in the industry, profits can be less than 10%. That's it. No more. In 2018, the average profit margin in Singapore's restaurants was 5.5%. Imagine, for every dollar you spend at my restaurant, I only make about 5 cents. But in spite of the long hours, tight cash flow and thin margins, an average of 808 new restaurants enter the market every year. Okay, this is that's a, it. It's a more, a meter more than a meter, yeah? absolutely. Okay, Fantastic. Okay. Nice. Okay, this is a safe distance, I think. I think so too. Yeah. Beppe De Vito is a legend. With 22 years of industry experience and a Michelin star under his belt, he runs five iconic Italian restaurants in Singapore. Do you think the restaurant scene in Singapore is oversaturated? I believe so. We've seen uh, way too big of an expansion over the past few years. Uh, the entry level to operate in this business is too low, and the standards are not there also. Anybody can do f &B. Any customer can come in and talk to my manager, to my chef, and take them and open a restaurant tomorrow morning. Nothing is stopping them from doing that, as long as they have some funds to do it. They will increase your average uh, rental, they will have to pay your stuff a little bit more to steal it from you, and they end up uh, uh, setting up something that uh, uh, may not last even the, the five years. Is this sustainable? There is a, a bit too much uh, of, uh, of the same out there. Do you believe that this pandemic represents a wake-up call for the entire restaurant industry? I totally believe that. The way people eat, how they eat, where they eat, that is changing. Perhaps it's time for us to ask, how many restaurants does Singapore really need anyway? Now, during this period, plenty of restaurants are going to shut their doors. And as a chef, this is tough to see, it's hard. But maybe it's about time, right? For the rest of us still weathering the storm, maybe it's time we took a good hard look at what needs to change and if we need to trim some fat. A month and a half into Circuit Breaker, and this list has made its rounds on social media. It hit home. My livelihood is built on a very fragile foundation. And we're off. Since January, Singapore's vibrant dining scene has lost over a thousand F&B outlets. And counting. This is a salad and dessert. I was still soldiering on doing deliveries. Thank you. Have a good dinner. Bye-bye. But one day, at the end of a particularly grueling day of food deliveries, it hit me. I was barely keeping my head above the water. So the biggest challenge here was having 70-80% of our sales just evaporate overnight. You can't sustain a team like that. You can't sustain the business like that. It's been terrible. I'm exhausted, my team's exhausted. I don't want to be just another statistic. I had to get creative. If your restaurant doesn't evolve, there may be not much space for you there tomorrow. For years, the government has called for the F&B industry to rely less on manpower and more on automation. They've used the carrots by offering incentive schemes and the stick, foreign labour restrictions. That's a huge hit for restaurants because it is hard to find Singaporeans willing to work in F&B. Restaurants are all about providing an amazing experience. Here's your menu, sir. Thank you very much. 
And amazing service requires amazing, well-trained staff. That doesn't come cheap. And it means having enough staff for key peak periods. Because each of us has a specific role. It's costly and compared to other industries, really inefficient. Red wine for you, sir. Thank you very much. And often we end up being overstaffed in the least busy period. Would you like to hear about our specials today, sir? Before COVID-19, I hired between 25 and 30 people in my restaurants, including part-timers and foreign workers. It makes up about a third of my total cost. And I wonder, are there ways to be less labour-intensive? Good morning. Your last plane with order number 539 is on the way. So I've arranged to meet Ella. Please enjoy your latte. According to her creator Keith Tan, Ella is a state-of-the-art robotic barista. She makes exactly the same quality as our top barista, but at four times the speed. So, would you like to try it out? I'll have a cappuccino. Sure. Confirm. Your cappuccino. There you go. She has a voice. Yes, she's telling you that she's preparing the coffee. Now, what's interesting here is you can order another one. At the same time? At the same time. Your cappuccino with order number 475 is on the way. Your order number 474 is ready. Please enjoy your cappuccino. All right, order 474. This is my fresh cappuccino. Uh, there's froth on top. It looks good. It smells good. According to Keith, Ella can make around 200 cups of coffee per hour. It's impressive, but isn't she just a fancy vending machine? Ella can be repurposed to do other things. So suppose today our system is now preparing coffee, iced coffee, iced cocktails. In the future, we might want to turn her into cooking some food. She's fast and she's versatile. But can she really make a better tasting cup of coffee than me? You know what, Ming? We should just test this out. Okay, sure. Let's do it. The rules are simple. Ella and I are making three coffees. And who scores higher, in terms of speed and taste, wins. Two, cap two cappuccinos, one latte. Wow, this is terrible. Three, two, one, let's go. Uh, 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 move the top, top left, top left. Top left. Let's go. Uh, milk, milk. Oh. Ah, it's making a terrible noise. Ah, stop, 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 stop. Okay, uh, now I need to wash this nozzle. Uh. This is a. Uh, this is that's supposed to be a latte. Please enjoy your cappuccino. And then a cappuccino has the thing of. Powder. Oh, f your order number five four two is ready. Please enjoy your cappuccino. Don't worry, I'm sure the robot's not done already, right? Okay, okay, okay. No in. Uh, uh. Oh, no, it will start rinsing. No, wait, don't rinse, don't rinse, cancel. Ah. No. Wait, 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 I'm on my... Ah! In a test of speed, Ella wins hands down. Okay, order's done. Time, stop. Okay, it took you five minutes longer than <sighs> But it's not defeat. Yeah, 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 you know, not to me, days. anyway. There's still the blind taste test. Hi, hi, hi. Hello. 
by a panel of three coffee lovers. Hi, Veronica. Hi, Ray. Can't wait to try this. I marked my coffees as coffee A. Ella's coffee is coffee B. I'm so anxious to find out what they think. A seems to have more milk and better texture. I prefer A. Yeah, personal preference is latte A. <laughs> I prefer cappuccino A. This is a pure win for me. Me, me. Pretty clearly, right? Taste wise, all the testers prefer my coffee. Uh, I'll, look, I'll give it to you, Ella. Uh, with your sleek, shiny, robotic, metallic arm, you were faster than me by a long shot. Uh, you made me look like a snail, essentially. So I win. Still, meeting Ella has been eye opening. I can even imagine deploying her to prepare ingredients or cook simpler dishes. But with a price tag of 150,000 Singapore dollars, I don't think I can afford to have Ella in my life right now. But this is not the end of my quest for a more sustainable restaurant business. Other than manpower, rental also takes a chunk out of my revenue. Which is why I am visiting my old friend Douglas, who recently took a huge gamble. Hey, Douglas. Hi, Ming. Hi. This is good to see you. What brings you here today? What brings me here? I'm here for a bowl of fish ball noodles. Hey, one more fish cake inside. Bro. One more fish cake inside. I want to miss that out. The last time I visited him, Douglas's stall was at Timber Plus which is a hip food court catering mostly to office workers. His sales dropped by 80% when the pandemic started because there was less and less of an office crowd. So he packed up and moved to McPherson. It's an area with a far older demographic. Surrounded by old residential blocks and industrial buildings, very different from the hip food court Douglas came from. He'll save $6,000 on rent every year. And he's got a space double the size of the previous one. Was this a calculated risk for you? Yes, it is. And has it worked out and benefited you during this Definitely. period? Definitely. So I'm glad that we made that decision. I was in Timber for four years. Very happy there. Very nice place. But again, you have to be realistic, you see. It's not whether the place is nice or, or the customer there very nice to you. Yeah. So had you stayed at Timber, do you think you will be able to survive during this period? Before Chai is still okay. When people start to work from home, the business dropped by 30 to 40%. Ooh. COVID-19 won't disappear so quickly. The environment is have changed. Completely the different. whole food industry will change. And people calling for delivery, all this is here to stay. Is that telling you or teaching you some lessons about where you need to go next? If any anyone is looking to move to a new location, you don't have to look for a very expensive, very luxurious place because you never know if you're going to succeed or not, you see. But it's less painful if the investment is smaller. How have you benefited, in a sense, from this location during this period? Actually, business has been better than when, while we were at Timber. Number one, I think because people have been working from home, so a lot of housing has stayed around this place, so people come and tapau, go back. In the F&B industry, one way to ensure a steady flow of customers is location. But this comes at a hefty price. Rents in these places are sometimes up to 60% higher than in less desirable locations. Douglas has shown me that we should be rethinking what makes a great location and how this helps with financial sustainability. But I wonder, with more restrictions lifted, and more people going back to their offices. Will Douglas's gamble to move from a tech park to the residential heartlands pay off in the long run? <laughs> Ka 
Khatib is a residential area deep in the heartlands of Singapore. It's known for fish farms and housing estates. It's 40 minutes to the city by train. Not exactly my first choice to set up a restaurant if I want walk-in customers. I am puzzled why architect Sanson Ng invited me here to talk about f and Is this a mall? Uh, no, it's not a mall. We are now at Home Team NS Khatib. So here is the main drop-off porch. Straight away, you see the restaurants or the full f and and then you take a walk down further down and you can see the indoor ar adventure arena. So there's a lot of activities so people get excited and people get engaged in this space. So what new norm are you trying to establish here? It is really forming this relationship with the community um, in order to sustain the f and that is why you need to decentralize these people into this community, be events or special bespoke dishes for that particular district. Positioning. Positioning, yeah, positioning. Yes. And I really think it's about contributing back to the community uh, by a form of charity. So only then I think the sustainability of FMB will happen. In a nutshell, what Sanson is advocating is for restaurants to be a bigger part of the local community so that in times of need, the community can rally to ensure restaurants in their area stay in business. Now this could be a way for restaurants to stay sustainable. But some businesses are going the opposite way. They disappear physically from the community altogether. Hey Ian. Hey, hi Ming. Hi, hi. Wow. I hope you're hungry for some uh, spicy mala stuff. Ian Tan's company runs 20 food outlets across Singapore, from Thai food to healthy salad bowls. Do we call the ambulance? <laughs> but this new venture is unlike the others. <laughs> Lady Boss Mala is a virtual brand that we created just for Grab Kitchen. What is the difference with um, running a you know brick and mortar store yeah. and a sort of online brand in a space like this? To run a restaurant, the rent in Singapore is extremely expensive. And running a virtual brand in a in a cloud kitchen, the rent is uh, is much lower. At the same time, when you run a virtual brand, you don't need a front counter. There's no cashier, there's no waiter or someone to clear the plates for you. Lady Boss Mala is among 22 F&B brands you can find at the new central kitchen launched by Grab. Known as cloud kitchens, these are large, shared facilities where many different restaurants can prepare food for takeout and delivery. Grab Kitchen Hillview is Singapore's largest and newest cloud kitchen. As we walk, we are actually going slowly towards the pickup area for customers. Dilip Rosanali agreed to show me around what he calls the future of dining. As long as they arrive here for a dining customer or a takeaway customer, yeah. they can order anything from any of these kitchens. Absolutely. <coughs> yeah. First try. Now, Dilip, I'm looking at this like lovely wall here with all these brands, right? Lady Boss Mala, that, that one just burned my tongue. Hence all these burning <laughs> questions for you. I see you've got five by five, so that's 25. Is this the maximum number of brands you can run from this space? <laughs> well, no, not really. There's no limit to it. Do you think cloud kitchens are here to stay? I do think, yeah. What we do is we minimize a lot of the fixed costs, which is the rent. And we go into a model where labor is not going to be as intensive. Also, that cost bucket is going to go down because essentially you're not servicing your dining lobby, right? You're only focusing on what you do best. You cook, and that's it. And that benefits all the merchants. So all in all, it makes it for a less volatile model. Even though we have a dining, it's not optimized for dining. Um, so the rent is low. With this, we really de-risk the venture for merchants. That, that's exactly what it is. So if you think about but what if I didn't want to give up my shop front? What else could I do? This time, the inspiration came in the form of crispy pork belly. One restaurant owner took a huge leap, and as a result, he has managed to sell over 10,000 pieces of pork belly in two months. Frozen pork belly? Roasted pork belly is a well-loved dish among every Singaporean, but it's actually, it takes about three days to actually cook a perfectly well pork belly. Very time-consuming. Super. So what we did was minimize and we cut short all the things that you need to do. Long before the pandemic, 
Dylan and his partner Kent realized that F&B businesses couldn't rely solely on having customers come to them. They wanted to bring food to the customers. Not typical delivery fare, but finicky restaurant food that typically wouldn't survive travel. And after three years in a food lab, they created a pork belly dish that you can make at home. All you need to do is roast it for 25 minutes, and it won't taste any different from what you'd get at Dylan's restaurant. The key thing to pork belly, right, is drying out the skin, getting yes. it very crispy, and yes. then keeping the meat moist. Correct. Sorry, I'm trying to be a bit nerdy with the food here, but this is not easy for people to do at home. Even in restaurants, it's a complex time-taking process. Yes. Are you very sure this can happen? Before you cut it, right, give me some of that music, please. All right, you ready? Firstly, uh, uh, so crispy skin. Secondly, all even. All right. It smells so good. As you can see, Ming, this is what it looks like before. This is the frozen the version. frozen version. May I? Yeah, please, go ahead. Completely rock solid, sealed up, no air. So this is the before, and what you're having is the after. Rock solid. So this keeps for how long again? You can keep up to a year. And I just take this, check in the oven, follow instructions. Oven, air fryer, Gautimtai. toaster. Okay, the proof is in the pudding. I'm gonna try this now. Wow, it's tender, it's juicy, and the skin looks nice and even, golden, crispy. Thank you guys all for today. <laughs> this is damn good, dude. Thanks, man. It's evenly seasoned. This is that brining stuff that you mentioned just now. Yep, correct. And it's incredible. This was heated from this yep. in a span of just 25 minutes. <laughs> I'm fascinated by Dylan's idea of bringing convenience food to another level. According to a Nielsen report from 2018, when it comes to demand for food delivery or pre-portioned meal kits, their use in Singapore is 11% higher than the global average. I think this idea is worth exploring. Pre-cooked gourmet meals can create a new revenue stream for me. You can order it online. You can warm it up and then eat it anytime you want. This also means I can utilize my team better. In order to prevent us from getting into that bottleneck, of sending food out in the middle of a peak period of time. These meal kits need to be chilled and ready for people to order any time of the day and store in their fridge. But first, I need to test what food works for these meal kits. So I prepared three dishes. Tacos. Right, let's just check on that crispy batter. Feels crispy enough for me. I'll wrap each ingredient separately for freshness and then deliver it to your home. Ooh. All you need to do is warm it up and assemble. Fresh tacos, crispy skin, all done in under 15 minutes. My second idea was the quintessential Singapore classic, Hokkien Mee, with a twist. The core to this dish is creating a noodle pancake that is going to have bits of charred crispy edges, a bit of smokiness. And I'm also not sure how I'm going to be able to guarantee a bit more flavour because there's no charring that can occur at home unless you have like a wok and a big ass fire and you're like frying it. A noodle pancake for Hokkien Mee Kit. So Oh, 
Okay, I'm quite satisfied with this. My final idea for a restaurant-style convenience meal kit was baked sushi rice. Yes, you heard that correctly. Yo! To make it suitable for heating up in the oven, I didn't include any raw fish. Instead, I used a generous amount of crab meat, smoked salmon, and flavoured mayonnaise. Why sushi rice? There is this very fun aspect to baked rice, caramelization, browning on top. The flavours are very fun. In this bad boy goes. Thank you. I'll see you in just a few minutes. Wow, that smells really good. <laughs> that barely took four minutes. As a meal kit, these dishes will be vacuum sealed and packed into a box. All people at home need to do is warm them up and garnish the food. Oh, ho, ho. look at that. Wow. As you can see, I'm quite pleased with my dishes. But the real test is still ahead of me. Let's see what some people say if I send it to them. Woo! <laughs> I have no idea what that is. It's not hocking me enough. There is no crispy for that. I feel a bit cheated. which are vacuum packed. Cucumber, tobiko. So this is how it looks like. So... I've spent the last three weeks trying to make these gourmet DIY meal kits. Oh my god. It's a lot more difficult than it appears because it needs to keep in the fridge for up to a week. And the moment you warm it up and assemble it, it must taste like a restaurant quality dish. I've prepared three dishes. Hokkien mee, a set of tacos, and the sushi rice bake. I've sent them to three tasters. Sounds good already. Well, there's a good mixture of yellow and the white thick bihun noodle, so that's great. I'm even flipping in this pan now. <laughs> okay, okay, she got it. Her, her frying pan was quite high sided though. That's, that's a little bit liquidy. Why? Oh, yeah. oh, this looks like the soup, really. There is a lack of wok hay. Maybe it's the way I cooked it. That's a little bit frustrating. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea what that, that is, but that, let's do it. Oh, you dropped it. Let's try. Put it in your mouth, Casey. You want, you know, you want a bit more of the tobiko, you want a bit more of the tomato, you know, you can... Getting you soggy. Ah, yeah, I, yeah, I should have as well. made it very clear. But, you know, then enough talk. Go, 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 eat it, eat it. See how it goes. <laughs> My seaweed sheets, I'm convinced now, are too large. This is something I definitely need to change immediately. It's not supposed to be soggy, it's supposed to be crisp. This was definitely my favourite. It's tokidon, tokibake, which is the sushi rice. Even though it was already pre-fried and reheated, it's still really, really nice. Um, it still has that nice crunch. The feedback was unexpected, but useful. I made so many tweaks and released the Hokkien Mee as my first meal kit for sale. 
It helped to bump up my sales by 30%. So while dining is now allowed again in Singapore, I'm keeping the meal kits in my menu. After all, restaurants are no longer what they used to be. Social distancing means we can only accommodate a fraction of the diners we used to have. It's bad news for our revenue. but I heard some restaurants overseas have found an opportunity to stand out in this new situation. There's this place that's fully embraced social distancing and they've turned that into a unique, exciting dining experience. Unfortunately, I'm not able to travel there. So I asked a friend to help me out. Rene Plum is an accomplished chef and TV host. You may say that he's a slightly taller Dutch version of myself. Rene, I hear you have a really nice lunch plan today. Where are you off to? Well, Ming, let me take you to a restaurant here in the center of Amsterdam that I frequently visit. A lot of Dutch restaurants are homely, tiny places full of gezelligheid which means simple coziness and conviviality. But with the need to keep a safe distance, one restaurant is reinventing coziness. The restaurant, Mediamatic Eaton, conceptualized quarantine greenhouses in May, when Amsterdam was still on lockdown. Hello there. Hello. Hi. The top? Yes. A little bit because we're going to put them fresh in a, Just the in top. a salad. Okay. A distinct characteristic of the restaurant is the big greenhouse where they grow most of the produce that they serve. Hence, they decided to create mini greenhouses for their customers to dine in. A safe and creative solution. Even the staff cannot enter these mini greenhouses. Instead, this is how they serve food. Yes, you should play exactly. Perfect, thank That's you. Mm. With the cherries, I will also try a little bit now. Listen, guys, I've got such a terrible job. Yeah? Yeah. Isn't it terrible? It's hard, yeah, right? I have to do this it's all hard. the time, tasting food. And... Mm. Tell me, Julia, is this the, the, the future of dining? Is this the new normal? So I think it's, uh, it's good to like, create those possibilities and see where they can lead to. Yes. So this concept is working. I mean, isn't there any other uh, restaurants, maybe in other countries, that will copy this? Well, they could. I think also like the, the nice message that we wanted to give is that we could is inspire other people. What these guys at Miniamedic are doing right now is they are turning something terrible, something negative, this whole virus thing that is all over the world, they are turning it into something positive, into a new concept. So what, what I learn here is that new concepts are born based on something that's maybe negative. Correct. Yeah. I mean, exactly. I mean, it's, this is a completely I mean, like new... Of course, like, you it might to, work. You have to go out from your comfort zone. Like yeah, you have to... absolutely. How was your lunch? You feel safe, but it's also very comfortable and you have complete privacy. Uh, it's a fantastic idea. Mediamatic might be the first restaurant in the world that turned pandemic into profit. Yet another example of how a wake-up call can spur innovation and creativity.
the pandemic was a long-needed catalyst for change in the F&B industry. It challenged mindsets and preconceptions of what a restaurant should be. And it opened up avenues for innovation. I'm prepared to follow the hard lessons that I've learned over the last couple of months. And I hope others do too, because there's no way forward unless we're flexible and we evolve.